Being a nutritionist for 14 years has taught me that it's not always about food. Truly healing ourselves requires us to go beyond things like calories and the intensities of the reps that we have in our gym. And honestly, it's about bringing together things like, you know, our emotional wounds, alternative healing therapies, food, medicine, the way we think and feel about ourselves together so we can have a more holistic approach. The Collective Experience is a platform where I want to bring all of these elements together rather than separating them and segregating them. This podcast is about experiencing the oneness in all of the differences. In today's episode of The Collective Experience, we're going to talk about sexual abuse, which is a significant but also very preventable adverse experience. Now, you will hear about what can actually happen when a child goes through sexual abuse trauma and the impact it can have on his or her physical and mental health while growing up. Also, how and why physical ailments actually manifest in the body as a byproduct of sexual abuse, how it impacts our relationships, even the type of partners we choose, and most importantly, how it affects our self-esteem. Also, if you are somebody who's battled with this, we talk a lot about how you can begin your journey to heal this trauma. Today, I have Nia Roy joining me to talk about sexual abuse. Nia is a clinical hypnotherapist. She's a sound teacher and a yoga teacher. She aims to empower her clients to find the root cause to transcend their physical and mental limitations through unconventional yet very holistic approaches to achieve their goals. Now, in her private consultations, Nia focuses on healing through hypnotherapy, metaphor therapy, life coaching, and obviously does a whole lot of goal setting as well. But the one that I found most interesting was graphology. Now, Nia works with clients from all different ages uh, in all walks of life to help improve their relationships with their environment and also their own mental well-being because she strongly believes that their outer experience is a reflection of their inner reality. Hi Nia, I'm so happy that this is finally happening because we've gone back and forth so many times. Absolutely, it's been it's been a while, so I'm excited too. So, uh, and this topic is so important; it's yeah. so prevalent. Yeah. Uh, but I think before we jump into that, I want everyone to know a little bit about you. Okay. So I know you do hypnotherapy. Yeah. There's something called graphology yeah. and metaphor therapy as yeah. well. But out of all of these therapies and modalities that you use with your clients, yeah. which are the ones that you, or which is that one most favorite one of yours? I would say it's definitely clinical hypnotherapy and combination of uh, graphotherapy. And metaphor therapy comes in, but I would say if I had to pick top, it would be clinical hypnotherapy and then graphology. What is graphology? So it's basically um, analyzing your handwriting and rewiring your mindset by changing the way you write. Because um, the extensor and flexor movements of your finger is directly related to your subconscious mind. So even oh, wow. the way you write, the way the way you write certain letters have a meaning, deeper meaning to it. So just by changing specific letters, you actually have direct access to shifting that mindset in that area of your life. Wow, that makes so much sense yeah. because I mean, I've only gone to people who helped me change my signatures mm. and I've seen a lot of other people do it. Uh, but I'm sure it takes a long time to actually change your oh, yeah. diet. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, you would need to do this um, for, a, I would say, maybe like 7 to 21 times for like 21 days. You need to keep doing it so that it becomes very unconscious later on. Yeah. For sure. But that's, that's like the homework part that I ask my clients to do. Yeah. But my go-to is definitely clinical hypnotherapy for sure. Yeah. Uh, I've been to a hypnotherapist as well before and I remember during that time because I was going for a couple of sessions the impact on my anxiety was was the best when I did hypnotherapy you know yeah. there's there's so much um, depth in it yeah. and I feel like with these kind of things you have to go that deep to actually change oh hundred yeah. percent because the the whole point of hypnotherapy is you're working with your subconscious mind which yeah. is about 88 to 90 percent of your mind and that's that makes it six thousand times stronger wow yeah so any changes that you make in your subconscious mind it naturally translates to your conscious mind and that's that's why it's super effective so going to a psychologist uh, when it's just talk therapy not saying there's anything wrong with that but when you're only working with the conscious mind, it takes a much longer time yeah. versus when you're working with the, uh, the subconscious. subconscious. A lot of people thought this was fluff earlier, mm -hmm. but now they're beginning to realize it. And it's so great because now the conversations are more open, they're more yeah. honest. 
Um, which brings me to our topic today because I was doing some research on this and I saw there was an NIH published study which said that worldwide, 8% mm -hmm. males mm -hmm. and 20% females under the age of 18 are sexually abused, molested. Yeah. You know, that was one. Then the other statistics I came across was in India. Mm -hmm. Every 155 minutes, there is one child under the age of 16 who's raped. The worst is how only 25% of these people actually talk about the experience. 3% yeah. is, I think, reported to the police. Yeah. But the remaining 70, 72 do not even speak about it. Absolutely. So there's so much prevalence of this, but I feel with awareness it can actually be prevented. 100%. But again, before we dive into that, let's talk a bit about what really happens to a child yeah. when they go through this experience. So when, especially, let's say, when you're a child, first of all, you're only beginning to understand who you are and, and what's right, what's wrong. You, don't, you have no grasp about it. So a lot of the time, sexual abuse need not just be someone that you don't know. It can be your own family members. Mm. So a child does not really know what's, what's the difference between a loving touch and a touch that's not okay. So, so I feel like kids know, right? Don't they already? But intuitively know this. They probably will Post, know exactly. Know, three, four. So they would intuitively know, but they it, it will be that confusing feeling like, is this right? Is this wrong? Yeah, and and so on. So like you could probably have uh, an uncle who would be very nice to you, very loving, very caring, but his touch may be loving to you at first, but later on your body feels comfortable. Yes. So this is how you know that intuition that you don't feel comfortable, but you second guess yourself. And add that on mm -hmm. with the stigma that the society puts uh, on you when it comes to any form of sexual abuse where you know, you're not allowed to talk about it or it's not okay, or even if they did let's say share that to a family member like your parent or aunt or an uncle they'd be like don't say this to anybody so you could imagine what a child goes through that uh, when they second guess themselves when they doubt their selves and even worse when they blame themselves yeah so this is essentially what happens to a child when a when they are first exposed to some form of sexual abuse and they learn to just bury it if they don't address it, if they don't share that with anybody, they would learn to maybe cope with it or bury it, forget about it, because this is what children do best. Yeah. When, when you're young, when you don't really know how to manage your emotions, the best way to deal with it is to dissociate or to form logical conclusions. But these logical conclusions need not be right all yeah. the time. And when you're much later in life, they've probably turned into belief systems, and when you're much later in life, it can literally be any trigger that can reopen up that Pandora's box and it can come in forms of dreams or panic attacks, anxiety, um, issues with your partner in terms yeah. of intimacy and so on. So we know now that it's not just in the head, yeah. right? Uh, I've had a lot of clients who experience this as well and some of them are very aware, of course, what's happening and they've been to a therapist and processed all of this unresolved trauma but some of them actually say oh but it's no big deal oh but I've forgotten about mm. it and that I've forgotten about yeah. it is actually you're right just yeah. burying it yeah. under right yeah, yeah. so we know that it's not just in the head and our body keeps a score of 100%. it 100% I was reading something about this as well and seeing how uh, there are studies on on how your brain gets altered mm. your hippocampus your uh, prefrontal cortex all of those activities diminish you know yeah so we know that the brain is altered, yeah. but we also know now because of cellular memory that the body, yeah. it, the trauma that is unprocessed starts yeah. to manifest in physical ailments. Yes. I want you to deep dive into this yeah. and talk about the correlation between the two. So basically, any time you go through any form of trauma or, or emotion, negative emotion, that's very hard for you to digest, it gets stored in the physical body. And the part in which or the, the areas or the organs that it gets uh, latched onto, let's say, it's very similar or it, 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 it correlates to the function of the organs. For example, let's say if um, you've been through something traumatic and you can't speak up about it and, you, and, and, and it's undigested. So this 
this learned ability to suppress yourself, to not express yourself, it then gets perhaps stored in this area. Mm. And this later on gets developed as thyroid, thyroid. and, and yes. so on and so forth. Mm. Another one, for example, let's say something has happened and it's very hard for you to digest. What is the function of the stomach to digest? So anytime you have issues that's very hard to digest, it will perhaps manifest in your stomach as IBS yeah. or, or whatever it is. So different areas of the body body for another one let's say um, a, a few clients that I've seen hemorrhoids hmm. the and that's at the base of your spine and this is very much related to security and stability in yeah. life so anytime certain issues that you face affect that security or stability in life that part of your body gets affected so different ailments if you really deep deep dive into it and look at the function of that particular organ you can kind of see how that correlates to their emotions and how they deal with those emotions. Yeah. You know, this reminds me of the book uh, by Louise Hay, You Can Heal Your Life. Yeah. I think yeah. all of us as children who got a read of that, like were able to read that book, yeah. were blessed in some oh, way 100%. because we understood this long back. Uh, of course, when you grow up, you <laughs> tend to forget so many things. But then now when you're talking about this, it takes me back mm -hmm. there. Plus, I recommend this to many of my clients yeah. because it's insane how many women oh, yeah. store so. I have clients who've been raped as well. Yeah. Now, when they go through this, they store this shame right here. And these are the women generally who grow up with fibroids, yes. endometriosis. Yes. And um, it always starts with the gut. Because I yes. think we were talking yes. about this yesterday. We were like, yeah, it's the solar plexus yeah. and it gets stored here. Yeah. And it makes so much sense because yeah. all your energy gets jammed there. Yeah. And then you have, you know, IBS as the beginning. Exactly. And then when you don't do anything about it, we all obviously know the implications exactly, later on. Exactly, exactly. But I do want to talk a little bit about how it, it does change our personality, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, our experiences, our past experiences shape us a certain way and I've seen that women who have been sexually abused, and again, sexually, sexual abuse does not mean rape. Yeah. It could mean being fondled with, yeah. groped. Yeah. Basically, anything that happens without your consent, yes. right? Your boundaries are being crossed. Yeah, but yeah. these are the women who find it very hard to set boundaries mm. and to say no. Yeah. That's a personality trait I've observed all, all across. Yeah. Now, which are these other, you know, traits or behaviors that we can pick up on yeah. to understand that there's, there is more unprocessed yeah. trauma that yeah. needs healing? So one thing that comes to mind was uh, is a client that I had. So she was uh, sexually abused and since that event, she just kind of flipped her personality like complete opposite. So she was extremely shy and quiet. And after this incident, it there was a 180 degree shift. So she was a lot more um, out there, vocal, oh, confident, wow. but also when it came to relations, she was a lot more promiscuous mm. and she was very, um, let's say she would uh, attract men or she would get pleasure out of uh, hurting men or cheating on men or, or you know, th that kind of personality. So that is one kind of personality shift. Another kind of personality shift with another client of mine, and uh, it's every time she would have sex with her partner she could only have rough sex yes you yeah. know and 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 it's it's the first sexual interaction that she had which was an abuse and she could only relate to that kind of intimacy she yeah. could and any time and I, I believe there was also another movie about it with Mila Kunis lucky, lucky yeah. so. I think it was such a great movie That's so underrated they yeah I don't understand how I didn't pick up and I didn't gain traction because that movie explains it so beautifully mm -hmm. your relationship with your food firstly mm -hmm. your relationship with yourself is skewed yeah. as well yeah because again you second guess yourself you blame yourself in many ways self-esteem takes such a big hit mm. um, and then your relationship with food is affected as yeah. well she speaks about yeah. how you know and then she yeah. goes crazy when yeah. her, her boyfriend leaves, 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 and, leaves she, and she's mm -hmm. stuffing the pizza it's insane how spot on that movie is and then even at the end what she chose to do and all of that right yeah. so yeah I think we, we women who go through this also choose men a certain way because yes. their behavior changes their belief system changes absolutely and then they attract different kind of men um, what happens to their, suppose they, yeah. you know, women listening, if they've gone through this experience, yeah. um, spoken about it or not spoken about it, but how can they 
make correlations to what's going on with their life right now with their partners right now yeah if they are already in a relationship how can they heal that so it's very interesting because f- even if you've been through sexual abuse you might not have uh, a- any issue with your intimacy let's say f- you know when you meet your partner or in the first couple of years of marriage it would be absolutely fine it may even be at a point where there's a certain trigger and this get and these memories come up and so on and there can be a complete shift and this is when issues actually start coming up or let's say when you get married and then and you can't have sex or it's too painful and so on so these are just initial signs if this is the case what's extremely important is for your partner to be patient mm. because it's also the other partner getting triggered because he's also an, if it's he or she or whatever it they will also second guess themselves and say am i the problem or they can get impatient and and yeah. and when if you are sexually abused and you see that frustration on your partner and you're also frustrated and 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 you don't know how to handle the situation it can completely tarnish the relationship yeah. so patience is one thing for sure being able to empathize with your partner communications is another one and fourth i would say definitely the the person who was sexually abused to somatically deal with the issue because when you go through trauma and if it's undigested it gets stored in the body you cannot uncreate anything by just thinking about it yeah you have to feel through it so this yeah. is where body work comes in this is where somatic release comes in so i would the, the person who has been abused needs to go to therapy or work on it in in somewhere that you can't just think your way out of yeah. it. Yeah. I agree but it's so hard right for some people who've gone through this um and they haven't processed it and they've kept it aside. It's really hard for them to go and sit in that pain. Yeah. You know I read this by Rupi Kaur um love her. She is like when you have a wound you have to go right to the bottom of that wound mm-hmm. and that kiss it all the way up. and it made so much sense because if i think about all the things that i've experienced which i have you know gotten over yeah this is what i- is required to do you need to go to a therapist sit with them talk mm-hmm. about it mm-hmm. feel the pain yeah and then once you fin- because your brain gets bored of feeling it as yeah. well right yeah. and once you finish feeling the pain then there's this blossoming that happens uh but for women i've seen it's very hard like there's a client of mine who very young uh 32 for i think she's 42 kilos or lesser i think struggling with massive anxiety yeah. again it started off with ibs mm. but now it's gone to a lot of intolerances mm. and she can't digest anything yeah literally anything she eats bloats her and yeah. she has diarrhea yeah so it affected her work and she can't obviously can't go to work anymore it is now affecting the relationship she has with her husband So when we go down and talk to her about her childhood trauma, yeah. she actually spoke about how she was molested by an uncle of hers. Mm. And then she's spoken about this to her parents and her family and they did nothing. Yeah. So when uh, your family turns your back and you do nothing and you see yeah. this uncle who's molested you every time at a family event, yeah. how do you deal with it? Oh my god, this is this is so it's s- toxic. It's, it's so sad that this happens because what that what that tells a child is what you're feeling is invalid mm. and 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 that just adds on to them second guessing themselves and then turning into this is this was my fault or there's no point i have no support yeah so you can, i am worthless and i am worthless mm. or I'm i not, deserve this i des- oh my god yeah. i deserve yeah. this so you can imagine and and the way i like to look at it and this is an analogy i tell my clients even though you're the adult of today right and you know you're here in this room if you look at yourself as a computer the hardware is your body but you have multiple softwares inside so even though you're the a- mm. adult of today and you're in this body the software of that molested 7 year old will be playing so yeah. unless you actually go to that moment and bring up those feelings and address the conclusions you made in that moment about yourself and and work your way through unwiring that process all the other softwares get affected 
Yeah. You know, and and that's a software that you live through and you view the world through, right? So because you get programmed a certain way. 100%. And then all of the you get set in those ways. Yeah. Uh, but that's why I wanted to know a little bit more about what are those personality traits? Like I know for sure mm -hmm. when I'm talking to a client and she talks about how she is with her friends or family or husband especially, mm -hmm. I know that she and my follow-up question will always be was there anything that happened in your childhood mm. that you know crossed mm. your boundaries sexually yeah. and that's because i picked up on the fact that it's very hard for her to set boundaries yeah. so what are these other traits yeah. apart from boundary setting low self esteem mm. you know so another thing that comes to mind is looking at how people take in information okay and this gets developed in the ages between 0 to 8 so to give you a very simple example let's say growing up if you wanted to uh, go out and play and you went and asked your mom mom can i go out and play and she says okay if you clean your room then you can go out and play so in your head okay i clean my room i can go out and play if after you cleaning your room your mom lets you to go out and play mm. she, the, the the messaging is okay i can trust what she's saying and the messaging is direct However, if after you clean your room and your mom says no, now you can't go and play. Now, I realize okay, I can't fully trust what she's saying. There's wow. a double meaning. So there are people who take in information directly. So what you say they take it in, mm. and there are people who second guess it a little bit. So there's an extra processing that happens. Wow. And I call these the head rule people and the heart rule people. And this is all based on your experiences the going head? up. head ruled and the heart ruled okay the so head ruled head and the heart ruled, ruled. and heart yeah. ruled yeah and what happens with these two characteristics is even the way physical ailments get manifested it's also very different mm. so the heart ruled personalities they are very much in tune with their body so it's almost like their emotions and the body is one so any time they feel an emotion their body can handle mm. it but the minute they it crosses that body boundary then they get emotionally it's almost like they can't handle their emotions whereas the hetero people they're very good at handling their emotions so when something traumatic happens they they can keep their calm they can analyze it and and that mm. internal processing happens but these are also the people who are more prone to chronic ailments because of the suppression the head ruled one the head ruled one oh, wow. so you will see head ruled personalities having a lot more autoimmune diseases than heart ruled personality because the heart ruled personalities are already good at processing their emotions they feel it completely mm. in their body so it's very interesting so to see so where does anxiety come in so anxiety or panic attacks it's the failure of your parasympathetic nervous system. So any time there's a form of threat, your sympathetic nervous uh, system gets activated and yeah. think of it like an upward curve. So when that per that perceived threat is no longer there, your body should naturally regulate itself and the yeah. parasympathetic nervous system kicks in. The panic attacks and anxiety happens when this failure of the parasympathetic nervous system happens and it's an ongoing hmm. upward curve. And the threat is you know it need not be an actual abuser it can be your boss it can be your mother-in-law it can be a, a constant threat in the environment that you're subconsciously thinking okay my survival is at risk here and and this constant state of stress okay. so this is what this is where anxiety and panic attacks and then this in. chronic stress is obviously leading to chronic chronic inflammation and then that leads to uh, you know autoimmune conditions exactly. so that completely makes sense But then, Nia, what is the balance? Because if I'm heart true, <laughs> I am anxious, uh, and I am I'm one of those. Yeah. You know, uh, I am you know mostly anxious. I'll process yeah. my emotions. I pick up the phone, talk to my friend, talk about it. Yeah. Uh, but then I know some people who are head ruled, yeah. and they're very calm, calm. <laughs> and they know how to keep. So, so where's the balance then? So this is the thing, right? It's again, it all comes down to. repression of emotions. Mm. As long as you process it, it doesn't matter how you process it, that's good because you're getting it out of the system because the funny said to a uh, funny thing that I read a while ago. So, um after the World War 2, you know how bad Japan was. Um and and how mo how quickly they they got back onto their feet when they had like 18 hour work days and so mm. on. They cracked a code all the corporations they cracked a code where 
under the building or in their basement, they would have cutouts of their bosses, and mm. and their companies would actually have massive live cutout of their bo of their bosses, and they would give them permission anytime during the day. You feel stressed, you can go and just whack your boss. Oh my god! So wow. what that did was it allowed them to not hold stress and emotions in their body, really? and they could just take out their frustration. And once they're done, it's good, sorted, and you're back. So what this shows is, whether it's through breath work, whether it's through mm. yoga, whether it's through crying, whether it's whatever it is, do not suppress or repress your yeah. emotions. Deal with it there and then. Because the longer you hold it in, the stronger your coping mechanisms are. And your coping mechanisms... Sorry, the longer you store it in? Yeah, the stronger okay. your coping mechanisms are. And the stronger these coping mechanisms are, it will keep, it will keep working until it gets to a point where it oh, no wow. longer works. And this is when people yeah. actually go to therapy. But yeah. by this point, you would have IBS, you would have physical ailments, you would have a ton of issues. Yeah, no, this reminds me of two things. One is a smash room <laughs> in Dubai. Yeah. But I know a lot of people saying, I don't feel better after. <laughs> so I think, yeah, in that temporary, it's a temporary yeah, fix. It's a temporary fix. But I think the only way to actually fix your emotions and all of this healing, I think it can only happen in a more gentler way. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I think it, it temporarily it makes sense yeah, to smash yeah. things around and break. I don't know, yeah. You can break TVs and tubes and God knows, you know, smash your phone as well. Uh, but I feel like that's not a long term solution. It yeah. needs to be more like understanding where, yeah. you know, like literally going to your wound and understanding where, what are the belief systems you've created Absolutely. and then unlearning those. Absolutely. Um, and, and then it can happen very, very. You don't, like you said, you don't need to go to a smash room. Hmm. You can just stay in the exact same space or place you are and just do one little trick of elongating your exhalations oh because wow. that's mm. the quickest way to activate your parasympathetic nervous system yeah because when you think about it when you're stressed the first thing that changes is your breath, your breath. It, becomes it, goes, it becomes shallow, shallow. It, yeah but the minute you elongate them it it calms you down and another thing is our, the natural number of breaths you take per minute is a, for a healthy person is about 14 to 16 breaths per minute. So the minute you slow down your breath, you naturally quieten your mind your as mind. well. Yeah. So uh, the Tibetan monks on average, and this was mind blowing for me, their natural breath per minute is six breaths per minute. Oh wow. So, so really slow. So really, really slow. So, any time, and one of the reasons why people say, oh, I can't meditate, or, or like my mind keeps going, like I can't meditate. One of the biggest reasons is they don't incorporate breath work. Mm. Because the best way to, because it's your, the function of your mind is to think. Yeah. So it logically doesn't make sense to quieten the mind because that's exactly what it's going to do. It's going to think, but you can give it a task, Yeah, which is if you give it some form of thing to focus on which is your breath and using your breath to slow it down it naturally quietens yeah. the chatter you know this is what i learned through uh, the book power of now mm -hmm. have you read it no i haven't but i've, I've obviously course, it's like a must read yeah, yeah it's a must read <laughs> but, yeah. uh, and people who feel like power of now is too spiritual or mm -hmm. too vague because a lot of people feel like that as well then there's another book called Untethered Soul, mm, yes, which I'm, talks oh, about this. Oh yes, my God, yes. so beautiful because our life the is the same here. author, right? No, no, they're two different okay. authors. Um, Eckhart Tolle also has The New Earth, mm. which is again beautiful. Uh, but uh, talking about slowing down and, you know, being in the moment, I think that is one way to crack this whole how do I heal situation yeah. because sometimes, and so many of my clients say this, no, I went to a therapist and became worse. Yeah. <laughs> That's because, one, you haven't given it enough time, yeah. you know, you were really, um, you know, there was just too much yeah. off yeah. for it to like balance out. It yeah. takes time sometimes. And the other thing is you didn't do the homework. Yes. You know, a lot of clients just don't do that. 100%. So, and I think I want to touch base on as well is one of the reasons why would they say, oh, I went to a therapist and, and it didn't work. It's also because you they probably didn't even look at other influences and especially when it comes to sexual abuse and this can sound uh, what do you say um, like a unfamiliar uh, opinion it's you 
if you've been sexually abused, I wouldn't be surprised if other family members have also been sexually abused. Mm. Because if it's you generational. Yeah, it's mm. generational. So you can imagine you carry a DNA that's been passed on for generations, right? So let's say if your great grandmother, your grandmother or mother, they've been sexually abused and with that sexual abuse let's say whatever their coping mechanism was which is probably most likely repression or not talking about it mm. that's very much stored in the dna yeah and that becomes a learned habit yeah but it's so hard to talk about it yeah. because when you talk about it you open up this whole new yeah. set of emotions which sometimes i feel like if you're dealing with it yeah. you know your parents don't need to know that this is what I went through when I was like you start thinking yeah. of those things right yeah, you start yeah. being the parent to your parent which is also I think oh yeah you uh, would be like that is an absolute no-no a child needs to be safe exactly. and doesn't need to be a parent exactly uh, but when you grow up then I don't know whether it's a good idea to actually talk about it to your parents and say oh this is what I felt when I, I, I was you touch base on a very very important point right here and I think it's amazing that you said this that a child needs to be a child and a parent mm. needs to be a parent because every family in it just like how if if you're if you have a heart failure or if there's something wrong with your heart every single organ eventually gets affected because it's a system yeah. the same rule applies to a family the minute someone goes through something it kind of trickles down to all the other members so what typically happens is there's an order in the family. So everyone has a position, everyone has an yeah. order, there's a balance in give and take. The minute that order is switched or swapped or excluded, let's say, the entire system gets affected. Mm. So for example, if a mom is going through something and the child now becomes a mom, becomes a parent, and now the mom becomes a child, that order gets affected. And the thing about parent-child relationship, energetically, parents, can naturally just give and you don't need that transaction of give and take mm. with parent and child relationship and children will receive and that's how it's been but the minute you swap and as a child you become the giver and the parent becomes the receiver you are not receiving anything you're only mm. giving 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 as a child and this is why uh, people get this issue of I have responsibilities. I my shoulders are aching. Yeah. I'm constantly giving. I'm not receiving. This takes wow. a huge role on their self-esteem and so on. So looking at family dynamics is also an important part when it comes to this as well, because it gives you a huge insight of what else are you carrying, and and what needs to be fixed as yeah. well. Like external. So what would you case. recommend? Suppose someone has gone through this yeah. and has dealt with it. Yeah. Would you recommend them talk about it? Or, uh, and it's happened like, because so many, uh, you know, with so many women, it's, it's already happened. Yeah. It's been 10 years, 20 years, yeah. you know, and it is something that's yeah. just in their system now. And they feel like they've dealt with it. Yeah. So would you recommend them to actually go and speak about it to their so, parents or caregivers? Because that's, uh, that's a tough one because mm. the whole point of therapy, it's to only bring the client or the person into acceptance. The minute you come yes. into acceptance of whatever it is, therapy stops. But how you get into that acceptance can vary from person to person. Yeah. For some people, it can just be talking. For some people, it can be other kinds of stuff. Yeah. So like you said, let's say if someone's been through something for 20 years and if they are at peace with it, hmm. then there's absolutely then there's fine. No need. There's no need. Absolutely. But if they're not at peace with it and it's it's their the way they cope with it is through suppression, then Or it's triggering them on a daily basis. Exactly. Yeah. Then or it's showing up in their physical ailments and things yeah. like that, and, then it's important. And that's when I would highly recommend they seek help. I know we're running out of time, <laughs> but I do have a couple of more things. So I'm gonna to get to that. I wanna know about look, parents talk a lot about safety, right? Yeah. They'll tell you, look at the road, yeah. both sides before crossing, the stove is hot, don't touch it. They don't talk about stuff like this and how, because a lot of times, the parent can't always be there with yeah. the child. Yeah, yeah, there are yeah. going to be instances where the child is by yeah. herself, himself. Yeah. Males can't be excluded mm -hmm. from this. Um, how, what do parents need to do to make sure that their child is safe? Yeah. So, 
I can tell from my personal experience. So my mom went through uh, something, and since then she was like, "Make sure when you're in an elevator, hold your hands like this. <laughs> so walk around oh, wow. like this." What? <laughs> so, so growing up, I've always it's been ingrained in my head that you can't be alone in, in an elevator with men, or or you'd always have to be careful. So what that taught me was. I have to be in fear around men hmm. all the time. I have to be careful. So even though the intention was to keep me safe, yeah, the lesson that was taught to me was fear that I have to be afraid. Wow, this is so interesting. So what hmm. parents need to be aware of? What kind of messaging are you teaching your kids? Is it empowering or is it fear based? Hmm. So how do you build a child's character? Wow, I love is, this. Is yeah. it through? Is it empowering or is it? you know based yeah, on fear exactly yeah. so you could keep a child safe by telling them this is what you can do this is how you can do it so the what the child then learns is when this happened i can do it or i can blah 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 but when you tell someone you need to be careful this is what protect yourself that's subconsciously tell the person that i'm weak i i, I can't mm. take care of myself i you know someone else is strong so I, what yeah so what should the parents do then so i would definitely say sit down with your kids and have a protocol of what they can do and most importantly building a relationship with your child in a way that whenever they're in trouble they are the first person that they should even think about yeah whereas you would know a lot of kids these days thinking oh i can't tell this to my mom i can't tell this to my dad hmm. you know? a lot of kids don't right they don't do that but i think um, and correct me if i'm wrong parents need to start talking about sex to their kids as well they need to talk about body parts they need to say you're going to grow pubic hair and what yeah. it means they're going to say because you know that's not done yeah. enough yeah. Uh, at least in in indian culture yeah. it's just not done i think that is where the root causes because people start to you feel shame associated with all yeah. of this right exactly um, 100% So I I think it starts from there as well, and of course, open Absolutely. communication and you know being there for a child and making them feel secure. And I think it starts from trust. Yeah. You can't tell your child, okay, let's do this, and then I'll give you that, and not give it to them. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you could see how how much responsibility parents must take. Yeah. When it comes to raising a child, and when something goes wrong, rather than blaming the child, looking at what did we not do, or what could have to, what could we have done. that could have helped the situation. Yeah. So taking responsibility rather than shaming, rather than getting angry, rather than reacting because the way you react now becomes the 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 messaging for the child for like the okay, child. this is I can't I can't open up. Mm. I can't talk about it. Therefore, I will just keep it in. I will shut up. Yeah. And then the cycle begins. So so to end this i do want to again summarize on what any anyone who's a bit i don't even know whether you should say the word victim anymore because yeah. now there's so <laughs> much like thing about yeah. around it right but anyone who struggled with this yeah. whether it is sexual uh, whether it is you know uh, yeah. something more intense like a rape yeah. or it's just fondling or groping and that has left an impression on you yeah. it always does we've yeah. spoken about that yeah. how what are the first few se- steps they can take to get over this yeah. first thing is coming into terms with what has happened therefore acknowledging what hmm. has happened because a lot of time you can be in denial right so first acknowledging and accepting the reality and the truth of it and second seeking help if it comes down to that if you feel like you, this is something that you can't handle yeah then definitely seeking help for sure yeah. but It starts with acknowledgement and acceptance of the truth of what has happened. Yeah. No, I agree it is the acknowledgement and that's what I think most of us struggle with because yeah. we feel like oh man my childhood was perfect. But it was not. Yeah. If something like this happened, then it was not perfect. You know, and it's okay. And because, exactly, yeah. it's okay. Yeah. And and it's cuz it's getting rid of that judgment that you also have towards yourself, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Like this happened to me, therefore I am this. Yeah. But it's so interesting as well, Rashi, I must say. A lot of the times people who have struggled with not just abuse but any form of trauma once they are identified as the victim, they often use this as a uh let's say a uh as some form of benefit. So let's say if you have uh, a very chronic ailment hmm. 
and you strongly believe like oh poor me I have this and because of this ailment I now get love and attention from my family members it's now become such a part mm. of your identity yeah. that without this ailment who are you like would you still get the attention would you still get the 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 love and so you would a lot of the times I've seen you hold on to being a victim or this yeah. issue so there are other hidden ben benefits that you get out of it. Uh, yeah, I, I know now, I, I get what you're saying. I've seen people do this. Some women just want to stay children. They're like, oh, my husband has three kids. You know, it's me and my other two yeah. kids. And that's because she's just, some of them just don't grow up in their mind and they want to stay childlike, so they're taken care of. I think we do this a lot with illnesses as well, right? We keep it yeah. and we nurture it because it's meeting a certain need 100%. of us. Yeah. And the minute you find that need or yeah. you work on that part, you will no longer need the illness. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I've seen people heal so much when they... And it's not got to do with the food then, yeah. you know? It's, exactly. And so many times you can be eating the best food, yeah. the best diet, but it does not work because there are these patterns and these limiting belief systems that you nurture Absolutely. and without therapists it's sometimes it's just hard to like break through those yeah, and, and it's and now like with therapy and like with it, mental health being so common these days I think it's only getting better I don't I think people are opening up a lot more yeah. and it's it's being normalized yeah it's being normalized anything. yeah uh, thank you so much, Nia. Thank you for thank having you me. So this is so much fun. <laughs> no, I'm glad you came and I'm going to call you often because <laughs> there's so much of all this. That I think we've just literally touched the uh, tip of the iceberg. There's so much more. Yeah. Uh, we'll cover a different topic the next time that you know we both feel is relevant. Yeah. But tell us how can people reach you if they want to reach out. So you can find me on Instagram. Uh, mm -hmm. My handle is at nia.hypnotherapy. Yeah. Or you can find me in Illuminations Wellbeing Center. I work there um, during the week. And, and you're taking also, appointments, like, you're seeing people one-on-one. -on -one absolutely. So you, you can find me there as well. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be sending you a lot of people your way. So. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Rashi, for having me.